सहनावतो सहनो भुनत्तो सह वीर्यम करवावहे तेजस्वी नावधि तमस्तु मावित विशावहे ओम शांति 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 हे ओम असतो मा सद्गमया तमसो मा जोतिर गमया मृत्योर मा अमृतम गमया ओम शांति 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 हे टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू रिसर्च गोइंग टू द रिसर्च मेथडोलॉजीज फॉर व्हाट वी हैव बीन स्टडीइंग व्हाट आर द टाइप्स ऑफ रिसर्च मेथडोलॉजीज अवेलेबल द ब्रॉड क्लासिफिकेशंस एंड व्हाट एग्जैक्टली डू वी यूज टू स्टडी द सेल्फ कॉन्शियसनेस what is science using and what what is vedanta and yoga using this is what we will go into and then you have asked for gayatri mantra so we will be discussing that in detail so that's the syllabus for today and uh, regarding this research methodologies there are two broad classifications which you should know one is what is called qualitative research one is quantitative research for centuries together qualitative research which is mainly the first person research was considered the main method of research and it was seen that the observation of the person who is experiencing something that is primary in in qualitative research always that is considered to be primary the observation of the experiencer is primary and uh, later on other kinds of methodologies were developed so we will be discussing both of them i will be showing it to you on slides what these two uh, methods are about now suppose let me just introduce first person and third person perspective to you because sometimes uh, students are not able to understand this what do we mean by first person perspective you say you know something in first person when it is an experience to you how does something feel to you Mm, that is the first person perspective third person perspective means it is being taken by an instrument and coming to you as third person data it is not in the first person mm. so like for example say you, if you say i am hungry and i say well what is the proof that you are hungry let me take a, a ultrasound scan of your stomach or a ct scan and if i trust only the ct scan report then that is the third person perspective you can say to a subjective experience like hunger and if i take your own version of it your own verdict that is the first person perspective now see during subjective experience usually we use the first person perspective there's a whole uh, philosophical method for that called phenomenology which also we we will be going into but usually what is happening is first person and third person data are being combined in any study even if it is the study of a purely subjective phenomenon like consciousness this is how science is also studying it because science usually uh, recommends a third person perspective third person neural data for something for anything that you are studying for your object of study and if the object is consciousness itself you can combine the third person data and the first person data first person analysis and that method is what is called neurophenomenology where you combine the first person perspective along with third person neural data and an interesting correspondence has been found that is why you know people of meditation are being taken into neuroscience in the research experiments of neuroscience because a very steady mind can be able to give you a perfect first person perspective and fmri scans give you the third person perspective and you can combine the two and there is a correspondence which they have found so these are broadly speaking the methods being employed let me show it to you on a slide uh the main first uh, qualitative and quantitative methods what they rely upon look at this slide see qualitative method and quantitative method of research conceptually speaking qualitative method is concerned with understanding human behavior from the informant's perspective and assumes a dynamic and negotiated reality quantitative method is uh, the very concept is it is concerned with discovering facts about social phenomena 
see it is it may not be a purely subjective research and it assumes a fixed and measurable reality. Methodologically qualitative research the data are collect, collected through participant observation and interviews. Data are analyzed by themes from descriptions by informants and data are reported in the language of the informant. While the methodology of quantitative research holds data to be collected through measuring things, quantification, is not it? Science is entirely based on this. And then the data is analyzed through numerical comparisons and statistical inferences and data are reported through statistical analysis, survey based essentially. Hmm? A few more points about the two forms of research. Look at this slide. See quantitative research and qualitative research. We are comparing now. Where, where are the roots of quantitative research? They are in Cartesianism and positivism. And the roots of qualitative research are in pragmatism and hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the interpretation of scriptural texts. Then the goal of investigation quantitative research is prediction, confirmation, hypothesis, testing. In qualitative research, it is, it is understanding, description, discovery, meaning and hypothesis generation. Design wise, quantitative research is predetermined and structured while qualitative research is flexible, evolving and emergent. It can keep changing. Sample wise, quantitative research requires large random representative samples while qualitative research requires small non-random purposeful samples. Data collection for quantitative research is through inanimate instruments like statistical data, surveys, questionnaires. Data collection for qualitative research is primary through the researcher, he is the primary instrument, semi-directive interviews, observations and documents. Mode of analysis for quantitative research is deductive and inductive by statistical method. Mode of analysis is abductive, see this is an important word for you to know that is through the researcher, through the medium of the experiencer of the phenomenon, through him the qualitative research takes place, that is the mode of analysis. And the findings in quantitative research are precise and numerical, while the findings in qualitative research are comprehensive, holistic, expansive and richly descriptive. Certain unique attributes of qualitative research further are. Look at that first thing, importance of context, importance of meaning and participant researcher relationship as also researcher as instrument. These are the most important characteristics attributes of qualitative research. Now when you study a phenomenon like consciousness, what type of research I told you today they are combining the two forms of research, but naturally from your own side what type of research will you perform? This again depends on what kind of training a person has received. See there are three areas where science and Vedanta meet and shake hands. The three areas are causality and understanding of causality, second is an understanding of consciousness and an understanding of the interconnectedness of life. Today, in today's uh, session, we are going to only study consciousness, how the qualitative and quantitative met methods together work for the study of consciousness. Because this is our main topic of interest, this entire course is meant for uh, discovery of consciousness. So, we will study only this phenomenon and how the th two methods are being applied. See, basically when you take a third person approach, what happens? Huh? A third person approach has been taken since the last number of decades and there they have found very clearly in this third person research that when you take a third person survey of something like consciousness which is a phenomenon which is purely subjective, you are trying to find in third person research neural correlates for that phenomenon. You are trying to find out neurophysiological correlates. If you are not able to find it out then your science is not complete. So, this is actually called the hard problem of consciousness studies. It is a term which was coined by uh, Shalmers in from New York University. What he essentially is trying to say is, you see for anything like for example, say a feeling of pain, if you can find a neural correlate, if you know which portion of your brain, the neurons from which portion of your brain are firing, you can give a, a kind of explanation to that phenomenon of pain 
to that experience of pain. Suppose I can't find a correlate, I do not know how to explain it through the mind, I do not know how to explain it through neurophysiology, so it becomes a hard problem. So, consciousness faces this tremendous hard problem because it has no functional correlate. In fact, it has no relational structural functional property as such and that is why it has, it has become difficult to track it to study it although different methods have been tried like from the third person perspective again they have uh, coined a term called qualia which are supposed to be qualitative representative properties of an experience. See how do I see a yellow flower as yellow and a red flower as red. So, maybe there are substances called qualia which are responsible for this difference, uh, they are essential properties of an experience only. So, all this was posited, but then scientists did not find qualia something like that as such. So, these are all theories which were brought up in order to explain the phenomenon of experience, the phenomenon of consciousness. Another theory which has recently come up, I think uh, it was in the neuroscience news some time back from neuroscience.com. It was sent to me by, by a scientist that they have found a neural correlate for conscious experience and it is actually it is called the L5P neurons. These are neurons responsible for the generation of conscious experience and that is why you can say in a way the experience can be anatomically studied and there is a third person correlate to the experience. They say that this, these neurons pr actually provide the connection between consciousness and its contents which are thoughts. So, these neurons are seen to fire wherever there is a conscious experience. So, today it has the most recent research has been on this. See this is a picture of those neurons functioning actually. Hmm? So, this is the current finding that these neurons are responsible for conscious experience. But it is still an ongoing research, they are trying to further find out how these uh, this the entire activity can be tracked. So, this kind of research is continuously going on. Now, from the standpoint of scientists, why they are so acutely studying this phenomenon of consciousness is you see when you have a conscious experience to the very last detail you become aware of everything. Like for example, you saw one leaf you can distinguish it from its neighboring leaf by so many factors, is not it? You can distinguish about 1000 shades of green in your conscious experience. So, that is why David Shalmer used a very powerful metaphor once. He said, how is it that the richly painted canvas of human experience is produced from a, such a small pellet of paints, which is the visible light portion of your electromagnetic radiation? How is it that it can give you so many shades of green, so many shades of blue, this riot of colors which you experience as life. So, essentially what is the explanation to conscious experience? How will you explain it? That is the essential question of this consciousness studies and in different ways they are trying to study it. You see from the Vedantic standpoint, basically Vedanta will put the question that you do not experience an, a phenomenon like consciousness ever in the third person. That is why you may not be able to find a third person correlate. For example, joy, happiness, do you experience it as dopamine or adrenaline? Tell me, unless we told you dopamine is responsible for your feelings of pleasure, you would not even know. In your experience, you have not yet felt dopamine, but how do you feel joy? How do you feel happiness? you feel it as a burst of energy within you, a lightness, a buoyancy in your heart. So, it is a feeling first. Hmm? So, from the first person perspective, how do you feel an experience? You have the experience as a feeling in your entire system. Hmm? Later on, there is a neurophysiological correlate which has been found which is told to you. So, even pain, any experience is felt as a feeling first and this is what they are trying to say. That is why first person observation of this feeling is the most important explanation to the experience. This is what philosophies like Yoga Vedanta are trying to tell you. Consciousness studies has explored, tried to explore all these questions about conscious experience. See, they are similar to Vedantic questions. The aim of both is the same. See how relevant these questions are, 
How does the brain create conscious experience? What does complete oblivion mean? How does perception become first person experience? How independent is our awareness from body mind complex? And then the heart problem which I just now told you, hmm? finding a neurophysiological correlate for conscious experience, that is the heart problem. And where do yoga and Vedanta contribute in this? You see yoga also, I mean Vedanta also asks similar questions. What is consciousness? How do we experience it? Can subjective experience, this is again a question which pops up in consciousness studies, can subjective experience be explained in objective terms? Can it be explained in physical terms? Then they are commonly asking the question, what are the appropriate methods to be used in order to do this? Hmm? See how relevant the questions are, see if the question strikes you, you will try to find an answer for it by yourself. If the question is like a theory to somebody's question, then the answer also will not hit me, it will not come to me, even if it is told to me. So understand the, the weight, the gravity of these questions, they must be the natural questions of a thinking mind, how am I thinking? Why is it that in awareness everything is happening, only if I am aware anything matters to me. So what is this awareness about? This is, these are natural questions which should come to a mind which is originally intellectual, not borrowed intelligence from books. Hmm? So you see these kind of questions you will find both in consciousness studies and in Vedanta. What are the neural correlates of consciousness? Can new methods be found to, to study consciousness? What are the properties of a conscious experience? Like for example, emotion, thought, are these are properties of a conscious experience? Or no, consciousness is apart from all this. What, can we develop rigorous methods of investigating and formalizing data about conscious experience from the first person perspective? This is also consciousness studies is asking today. What would be the implications of this science of consciousness to society? And can the study of consciousness be complemented by the contemplative traditions of this world? The great contemplative traditions of both the East and West, can they contribute to this understanding of consciousness. This is what they are trying to explore in consciousness studies and Vedanta also asks very similar questions. So how they are studying and how Vedanta is studying, you must have a general idea of it because your entire course is concentrating on self-discovery and management. Some idea you must have how they are trying to study. I already introduced to you the phenomenological method of Vedanta. What does it mean? See basically the, the primary departure from western philosophy about consciousness in Vedanta is it is neither structural nor relational nor you can say representational which means intentional. It stands by itself in its light the mind functions. This is what Vedanta holds. The, the fact that you are thinking you are having conscious experiences points to the fact of consciousness being there and it is independent of the mind. In fact, tasya bhasa sarvamidam vibhati, the Upanishads say, which means it is due to the fact of consciousness that the mind is becoming conscious. The body is getting enlivened. You are having conscious experiences in the outer world. Now you are asking for the, an explanation of that conscious experience without referring to consciousness standing behind the mind. How will you find it? So the phenomenological method primarily it is an inductive, qualitative, open-ended research method which is concerned with the experience, with the study of experience from the standpoint of the experiencer. How does something feel to me? Bracketing out all other assumptions, presumptions, all other methods, primarily how does something feel to me? That data is most important for phenomenological experience, phenomenological study and this is one of the primary methods of philosophy being used for subjective phenomena like consciousness. So when you have this, this kind of an approach, you know epistemologically speaking, this relies entirely on personal knowledge and subjectivity, isn't it? Hmm? If I have to ask how an experience feels to me, I must have an understanding of how I am functioning and a deeply subjective understanding. 
So, it relies on both of this and it relies on entirely on personal perspective and interpretation. Finally, I can tell best what is happening in my system and how this system is functioning. So, entire yoga if you see it is subscribing to this, this kind of a method. Hmm? How is it that I function? How is it that I know? We studied mind and perception, uh, basically what is it trying to see? How is it that I perceive? Before I jump and say this is one particular thing, I must know all the factors responsible for that perception for me to, to authenticize that experience, to make it authentic. Hmm? Otherwise, I might have added something to it, I might have removed something for it. I told you if your attention is flitting, you cannot grasp anything. So, the whole point comes to this that phenomenological uh, approach becomes very important in studying subjective phenomena. Now, I am going to try this phenomenological approach right here on you. We will try a few thought experiments in order to understand this method. Another understanding of phenomena before we go into the thought experiment is that how things are appearing to your consciousness. Hmm? See, I will, I will just give you one small understanding here. Hmm? Think about it clearly and see. Whenever you see an object, you are seeing that object as it is appearing to your five senses. Hmm? Now, suppose I am seeing this pen. This appears like a blue pen to me. To my senses, which are able to track especially this eye, which is able to track the visible light range, this is appearing as blue. Hmm? You know to some other creatures, if they were introduced here, this would appear as something totally different depending on their faculties of perception. Hmm? To me also, suppose I had UV light a, a capacity to uh, sensitivity towards UV light, this would appear something very different. If I had capacity to uh, catch uh, infrared radiation or radio waves, the whole world would appear something totally different. So, my perception is limited by my senses and whatever I am equipped to perceive, that much only I can perceive. This table appears like a table to me. You know to an ant moving there, this will appear like a mountain is not it? To a bird flying there, this is a speck. To a mite or a wasp, this may be just a pixelated something, not a table. To a cockroach, it is something else. With its compound eyes, it's some, it perceives something totally different. To our five senses, this is a table. So, what is this actually? This much you should be able to draw from this that my perception is limited by my equipment and I am equipped to perceive in a certain particular way. First thing about perception, second thing is always the perception occurs in my awareness. Because I am aware, I perceive things like I am perceiving this table here. So, perception cannot be removed from awareness, it is not apart from awareness. Due to these two factors that my apparatus is required for perception and perception is dependent on my awareness, you know the standpoint of Vedanta is that is why this has no intrinsic existence as a table in itself. It is dependent on these two factors to be perceived as a table. At first glance this may be a little hard for you to digest, but think about it and it will become very clear. You must only give it more thought. Nothing has intrinsic existence except consciousness because that does not require anything to validate its existence. Everything else requires awareness to become perceptible as that thing and it is of course limited by your senses to be perceived as that thing. So, due to this simple fact they say that intrinsic existence, essential existence or absolute existence belongs only to the Atman, only to consciousness, everything else functions on borrowed awareness, borrowed existence. Hmm? So, this is a, a, a huge theory in uh, Vedanta which explains why the world is considered unreal, unreal in the sense like this dependent on something for its existence. The term mithya is does not mean it does not exist, it appears as this in your consciousness, not that it is not there, 
Mm. We always, you know, mithya has been uh, a very corrupt word. It has been used very in a very wrong way for many centuries actually. Mithya essentially means as that thing it has holds only dependent existence. This is the meaning. It is a very technical term that is why and should not be used glibly. So, by using it glibly we made a mess of many things actually. But now we should understand since you are well trained in science you must catch these subtle points. What are they trying to mean by saying something is unreal? Not that it does not exist. It is an appearance to your consciousness as that particular thing. This is all they are trying to tell you. It is an appearance just like how you can say electro uh, color is an appearance of electromagnetic radiation, is not it? It does not exist apart from electromagnetic radiation, does it? There is nothing called color as such. It is nothing but electromagnetic radiation which is perceived as color by your equipment. So also is everything else. Essentially consciousness being perceived as that particular thing in your perception through your senses. So, that is how they are trying to understand that is why in Vedanta you will find sentences like subject and object both appear in consciousness, everything is an appearance in consciousness. This is what they are trying to mean. Hmm? If you have caught the essential point what intrinsic existence means and how it belongs to consciousness alone everything else has extrinsic existence, dependent existence, you will understand what they are trying to say through all these sentences. Now, the thought experiment which I told you. Right here we are going to perform, sit straight all of you because to understand this very clearly uh, you need full attention. See I will put a few questions, answer me and uh, try to solve the thing by yourself. Tell me when you sit still and think deeply, if I put this question to you is my sensation limited by the boundaries of my skin, is it true? Your sensation is limited by the boundary of your skin, your perception is not in limited by the boundary of your skin, right? Hmm? Now, what is within this skin is the body, what is outside the skin? It appears to be outside your skin, but it is never outside your awareness is not it? Hmm? You can be aware of a whole lot of things all together, which means what? What does this mean? You are not limited or contained within the skin. You are using it as an instrument functioning through it. In your awareness you are capable of grasping everything. Just now your mind can be in London. You may be perceiving a whole lot of things in your head you are not limited by the boundaries of your body nor are you contained within it, you are functioning through it nor are things different from you in the sense anything is outside my skin but not outside my awareness. So, you see a basic this is a, what is called phenomenological thinking from my standpoint, from my experience, my thinking itself I understood how I am functioning. This is not a theory, it is just an observation of a naturally occurring phenomenon which is happening with you all the time. Is not this true? Hmm? What we discussed just now. Now, let me put to you another question. Are we a body with awareness in it or is the body in our awareness? Are we a body with awareness in it? or is the body in our awareness? How do you feel it at any given moment of time? You always feel it as the body is in your awareness, you are fundamentally aware. In that awareness you are thinking, so you are positing a body. If you say awareness is in my body and I asked you where, point it out to me, you cannot point out. In your own experience you are fundamentally self aware. So, there is the thinking process, in that you posit entities and identify with them. Please see this, it is in your own experience. That is why body consciousness, thought, emotion, everything arises in my awareness. Awareness only can be fundamentally me, 
I means awareness. In that all this is happening. All my thinking, my science, my philosophy, everything is happening in my awareness. That is why I become aware of the body, the body does not become aware of me. Isn't it? I become aware of my thoughts, my thoughts do not become aware of me. Isn't it? So, awareness is the fundamental fact about you. Because you are self-aware, everything else follows. Human experience follows. So, you see, this is the phenomenological method. How you are seeing it from your standpoint. How is anything feeling to you? Now, one more thought experiment. Do my thoughts feel like they are mine or they are me? Mine. Why? Because I know I can see that thought. Mentally, you can actually see what you have been thinking. I told you memory, metacognition, all these are proofs that there is an underlying awareness which is common to both the streams of thought. That which you thought earlier and that which you remembered later. That which you thought earlier and which you metacognized later. There is something fundamentally common between the two for you to catch that experience in memory or metacognition. So, remember this, the very fact that my thoughts feel like they are mine and not me means I am the observer of that thought. I am fundamentally the awareness in which thought is appearing. So also with your body, you are, it, is, it is yours, it is not you. Again, it is an instrument given for you to function through. The, our fundamental mistake in understanding things is, we think this is me. Once you declare this is me, your thought will stop there, it will not go further. You tend to identify even with objects, not just with body. So, this, because there is no investigation, that is why self-enquiry, this existential enquiry is at the heart of Vedant. It is at the heart of understanding the reality about something. If you go and identify first and foremost, your thinking will stop there. You get involved in that identification. From that, you will get identified with objects all around you. So, that stops all level of investigation and inquiry. That is why alertness is the first thing required for this kind of research. You know, you must be alert and alive to the depths of your being. And then you inquire properly, the inquiry itself will lead you within. It will lead you to the source of your mind, source of your thinking process. So, this is how existential enquiry is what we call Vedanta Vichar, which is today's philosophically speaking what is called phenomenology, phenomenological method of enquiry. So, this is the first person method which is usually followed in yoga and Vedanta. Let me ask you one more question. Since we are doing it, let us do it properly. See, there is, you have experiences where you are referring to yourself totally apart from your body. I had told you about the dream experience hmm, in one of the classes. You can be identified with some other personality in your dream. Hmm? And you are so identified with that personality, you have the body of that personality hmm, and your eye sense is continuing to be the same. Because you are saying, I am identified with that particular personality. So, you can refer to yourself as a continu continuum, a continuity without special reference to one particular body. What does this mean? Your eye sense is always apart from the body. When it is identified with another body, you became the superstar, uh, cricket superstar in your dream. You identified with another body but the eye sense is the same, which means you have this capacity to refer to yourself quite apart from the physical body. This is such a magical thing, just think about it and see. Your eye, that is why Vedanta tells you, there is nothing which is, these two are not coexistent, the body and your eye sense. They are two separately functioning entities. The eye is functioning through the body-mind complex. You mistook 
the body and the mind to be I. This is your problem. Because of non-investigation, non-inquiry, in your own experience all the time, the I is completely apart from the body. The two do not coexist. So, I am the body idea has no basis in truth. But you see, this is a phenomenon so widespread. Everybody is only identified with the body. It appears to be so. But a little investigation in a very calm, sattvic state of mind will take you naturally into this. Always your eye sense sees the body as an object, the mind as an object. It is always objective to your experience. You, the experience, are always the, the awareness that is becoming conscious of the body and mind, that is seeing it objectively. In your own experience, this is all the time happening. You did not investigate it. That is the only problem. So, like this, phenomenological inquiry goes like this. You see, is not this interesting? Hmm? How do you get the feel of an experience? Another phenomenological question. What gives you the feel of an experience? See, the, the beauty, beauty of a sunset, the sweetness of a cake, the color of a bright flower, it simply hits you as a very conscious experience. What is responsible for that experience? Somewhere because you're, you are a self-aware entity, you are experiencing that thing video cameras, all these gadgets around you can catch the um, a memory, a picture of that thing, but cannot experience it because they are not self-aware. Awareness is, the, is at the heart of experience. Just through phenomenological inquiry, you can find out the profundity of the human conscious experience comes from the fact of awareness. So, this is how this particular qualitative approach method of inquiry goes. Now, I will just go into a method to take you into all of this, to give you an understanding of Vedant, Yoga. Uh, you know, most people are asking for techniques naturally. What is, what is the a technique, a method to go into it? If you just do this phenomenological inquiry, you come to the conclusions of Vedanta, Advait Vedanta especially. Because you will gradually see that subject and object are not two different things. Subject is subject only with respect to object. Both are appearances in your consciousness. This is not another theory they are building up. This is the natural fact about this world of manifestation, which is seen when you are able to do this level of inquiry. Then it becomes available to your perception. Otherwise, it is a closed thing. But is there a technique to generate this level of knowledge? Now, there are plenty of techniques. One powerful technique is what you asked for the Gayatri Mantra chanting. Gayatri Mantra comes in both the Rig Veda and the Yajur Veda. And today, now I am going to dwell only on this because many of you have asked for it. And since you want to know everything about it and how to chant it, we will do something of that for the next half an hour. But you must grasp everything that is being said because this is the most powerful mantra available to us to bring us to this level of experience, to awaken us to reality. You know, it is actually like a lighted torch which will open up the doors of wisdom for you. Gayatri is the most powerful mantra. What is a mantra? Mantra means manana trayate iti mantra. When you think about it repeatedly, it will liberate the mind. That is a mantra. And Gayatri means Gayantam Trayate Iti Gayatri. One who chants it, it liberates him. That is Gayatri. It is the most powerful mantra, which, which is also a prayer. It is a prayer Kama Mantra to open your Dhi, the higher faculty of the human intellect, which opens you to the heart of reality. It is called the spiritual heart. It opens the spiritual heart so that you perceive reality as it is. I have told you about faculty development. It is one of the ways of perceiving these higher subjective realities, what we have been discussing, consciousness and all that. One of the potent ways to do that is to awaken the dhi. This, this is a faculty of the human intellect which simply brings the truth into your heart. It floods you with the light of supreme truth. 
So the Gayatri is a mantra to do this. It is a prayer for this faculty. How do you use the Gayatri? See, first of all, let me give you some basic information about Gayatri. Gayatri is usually given during our Upanayan ceremonies, isn't it? For brahmacharis, for householders, it is a very important mantra because it will develop this higher intelligence in you. And Gayatri is personified as a Devi and it's, she is called Gayatri Devi. You must have seen the picture, hmm? a five-faced goddess. She is called Vedamata. She is the mother of all knowledge. From he comes all knowledge and the right perspective to everything. Hmm. So, it all depends on the development of this faculty of dhi. Please remember this, Gayatri has enormous benefits and blessings. Even if you do a little of it, you will understand its power. It will not just awaken the higher intellect, it will open all your faculties of intuition. In the Vedas, it is um, five faculties of higher intelligence are mentioned. They are like this dhi, which is your spiritual heart. Then you have medha, which is a very bright higher intellect. Then you have pragna, which is higher awareness, dhriti, higher will and smriti, great memory. Gayatri awakens all these five. These are five powerful faculties of your intelligence, which gives you transcendental, brings into your heart transcendental knowledge. Gayatri awakens all of these. It gives great inner stability to your mind, deep inner calmness, just the chanting of Gayatri and it will remove obstacles from your path. It will remove dangers from your path. That is the power of Gayatri. It also gives you very strong memory. You see the last thing which we discussed, concentration, memory, all these capacities of the human mind are awakened and enhanced by the chanting of Gayatri. Hmm? So, it is a very powerful mantra. I will first give you the story behind this mantra and then go into the mantra. Hmm? There is a big story behind how the Gayatri was uh, given out. You know how these mantras are come out of the mouths of sages? Do they think about it and invent them? They are mystic syllables which are discovered in very high states of samadhi and meditation. They are mystic syllables which lead into, which give you a direct insight into reality, lead you into reality as it were. So, it is not a matter of, it is not a thought construction sort of thing. They are the outpourings of enlightened sages and this mantra, Gayatri mantra was given to us by Vishwamitra Rishi. Hmm? The uh, person who gave out the Gayatri is Vishwamitra. The presiding deity of the Gayatri mantra is the sun, Savitra. Sun was the symbol of Brahman in the Vedic age, hmm? the supreme reality. And the meter used in Gayatri chanting also is called Gayatri. Now, this Vishwamitra Rishi, initially he was a king. He was a very great king, a very powerful king who had conquered a lot of kingdoms. It so happened that one day he was along with his entourage, along with his army, he was passing through a forest when he came across the hermitage of Vashishta Muni. Vashishta was a great Brahma Rishi of olden times. You must have heard of the names. Hmm? So, Vashishta's uh, hermitage he came across and he got down to pay his respects to the Brahma Rishi. So, you see this was our culture, always the greatest administrators was, would come and ask for spiritual knowledge, would bow down to spiritual knowledge because they understood its value, they understood its value to human society. So, Vishwamitra entered the hermitage and his army also entered, his all his troops and he came in front of uh, Vashishta, bowed down to him and asked for his blessings. And Vashishta asked, uh, asked him that everything is well in your kingdom and he said, yes, by your blessings everything is well. Please bless me with more power and wealth and all this. And then Vashishta said, please rest here for some time. Your men are also tired and I will offer you some food. Refresh yourself and then you can proceed. Now, Vishwamitra refused initially because he's, he thought, how will they provide us food? There are thousands of men hmm? and why should we simply disturb the hermitage? So, he said, no, it is okay. We will go back to our uh, kingdom and have our uh, food. But Vashishta insisted. 
So, Vishwamitra stayed back. What did Vashishta do? He got up from his seat, he went inside and he had a cow, a divine cow. Kamadheno you have heard, hmm? the giver of all boons. So, he whispered something in her ear. He whispered something into her ear and it seems this divine cow, she was a goddess in the form of a cow. Whatever she was asked for, she could give. So, he asked for food for the entire army and very quickly huge uh, vessels of all sorts of delicacies and rich food was presented in one corner of the ashram. And Vashishta went and invited the Vishwamitra and all his uh, disciples, not disciples, his uh, soldiers to come and have the food. All of them relished the food and it was divine like nectar. And then Vishwamitra was so surprised, he asked Vashishta, how did you get all this in this forest? And then he said, see I have a mother, I worship her as mother and uh, she is the one who provides us everything that we require and she is a Devi. So, then uh, Vishwamitra, you see greed came into him and the ego was already there. He thought this cow should belong to me because I am the king. Everything in, the, in my kingdom belongs to the king. So, he told Vashishta, give me the cow. I will give you any price you want for it. Vashishta said, do not make this mistake. She cannot be sold. She is a goddess. She is a Devi and she is the giver of all boons. I will never part with this cow because she will, she wants to stay only close to a place where there is this ambience, where there is Brahma Vidya being practiced, where there is Brahma Jnana. She will not go into your palace. But Vishwamitra was furious now. He said, what do you mean? I must have that cow. And he told his men, go and forcefully bring her. At once the cow ran behind Vashishta. And Vashishta said, do not make this mistake, I told you. Once more I tell you, she is a divine being. Do not make your soldiers touch her. Otherwise, you will pay for it. And Vishwamitra said, I do not believe in all this. I am going to take the cow and go. And then Vashishta just raised his Brahma Danda. You must have heard of the story. Huh? And the entire army was destroyed. All of the men fell down on the ground. And Vishwamitra was simply stunned. What happened? It was the power of the realization of Vashishta, which is that Brahma Danda which he would hold, he would just hold that uh, wood on which he would do his spiritual, his japa. And the entire uh, uh, army was simply destroyed. So, he said that there is some great power in this, in this particular thing. Then he tried to attack Vashishta, again just by raising the Brahma Danda, he became powerless without any strength. Then he said, Dhik Balam, Kshatriya Balam, Brahma Balam Eva Balam, which means all this, this prowess and uh, strength which I had, the ego which I had in being so strong and courageous with such a huge army, such a huge kingdom, it means nothing compared to this strength which this sage has. This is the real strength. A knower of Brahman is so supremely strong, just by his mind, by his will, he can control a whole army. So, then he said, well, I will acquire this kind of strength and then I will come and show you. And he turned back. He went back to his kingdom. He gave his kingdom to his sons to manage and he went into the forest to do austerities. And it seems for a long time, if you go to the Puranas, they will even say thousands of years. Because, you know, that sense of time is different. You know how they, they sense time? Time is in you. So, for a long time he performed austerities and then after that he uh, came to this understanding, slowly his mind was changing but still he had not overcome the tendencies of his mind, the tendency towards arrogance, ego, pride, this was still not completely gone. So, at this point of time comes the story of Trishanku. Hmm? Have you heard that story? You know, there was a king who wanted to go to heaven with his body. And he went and his name was Trishanku. He went and requested Vashishta, please help me. Vashishta said, please pass on. I do not do such stupid things. And he was angry. He went to his um, sons, Vashishta's sons and said, your father cannot send me, you please send me. So, he was cursed by his sons and he became a very ugly person. And then he comes to Vishwamitra who was doing his austerities. 
and he says you see Vashishta is refused to send me, can you do it? Now you see an enemy's enemy becomes your friend. Uh, so this uh, he became automatically became Vishwamitra's friend and uh, Vishwamitra said what Vashishta refused then I will do it for you, I am there do not worry. I have performed so much austerity with the power of this austerity I will send you to the heavens and he did, did uh, all sorts of his uh, rituals and all that and Trishanku started rising to heaven in that very body. But this is against the law of cosmic existence is not it one only after death one can go wherever according to his karma wherever he has to go and he cannot go to heaven like this. So at once Indra came into the sky and said you cannot do this please stop it and Vishwamitra said what do you mean I have done so much tapasya he will go up and so Trishanku hung in the middle they would not allow him into heaven and he could not come down on earth so it seems Vishwamitra with his powers created a heaven for him right there and like this uh, in, in a state in which he was upside down you know he hung there and even now they say Trishanku heaven when somebody is undeciding about something they say Trishanku state. So, this was uh, Vishwamitra's power. After this episode was over, Vishwamitra suddenly realized that he had spent all his power, spiritual power in doing all this for that Trishanku, just because he hated Vashishta and he helped him. He understood the level of his pride and his ego. It is all, you see, Vash Vishwamitra's life shows you how important it is to get rid of all this to control your mind to actually reach the knowledge of Brahman is no joke. Hmm. So, when he understood all this further he went into austerities. He said all my spiritual power got exhausted by doing all this I will perform more austerities. He went deep into the forest again he sat down again hundreds of years passed by. This time another big obstacle came before him in the form of an apsara called Menaka. You might have heard of that story also. So, she seduced him and then he uh, again he went out of his austerities and for a long time he was not in touch with this, this deep goal which he had fixed for himself that of becoming a Brahmarishi, getting the knowledge of Brahman, becoming equal to Vashishta. He forgot about that. After a long time he came to his senses and then Menaka also left him and he came to this understanding that how am I wasting my powers? How I am wasting my time, lust, anger, ego, hatred, this uh, feeling of uh, malice towards somebody, jealousies, all this can actually ruin you completely. It, it will stop your progress towards your fixed goals. This is what Vishwamitra's life shows. It also shows that through, through the triumph of his will and his understanding, he overcame all this. He again plunged into great austerities. And this time he got a certain level of illumination. After a long time of austerity, he got uh, the vision of Lord Brahma who came to him and asked him, blessed him with the title of Maharishi. Maharshi. Hmm? Then Vishwamitra said, but do not I deserve the title of a Brahmarishi? Then Brahmaji said, no, for that you need the blessings of a Brahmarishi. So go to Vashishta, <laughs> take his blessing. If you have re really removed all these negativities from your mind, if you have conquered them, not just removed temporarily, please see this. What tapasya means, you must have a knowledge for self knowledge, tapasya is required. So, tapasya means purging your mind of all impurity, completely cleansing it, not simply emptying it temporarily, becoming absolutely pure in every way, then only this knowledge is possible. So, he said go and take the blessings of Vashishta and Vishwamitra came to Vashishta. When he came near the hermitage, he heard the conversation between Vishwamitra and Arundhati. Vishwamitra, uh, sorry, between Vashishta and Arundhati. Hmm? Vishwamitra has come to the hermitage of Vashishta. So, Vashishta is telling Arundhati, you know I have been following the spiritual progress of Vishwamitra and I am supporting him silently that he attains this illumination. He is a good man, his very name indicates Vishwasya Mitra is Vishwamitra. He is the friend of all, but this arrogance had come into him. I hope he will be able to overcome it. I am helping him in his spiritual progress. As soon as he heard this, Vishwamitra was so ashamed with whom that is why he is a Brahmarishi. 
he is beyond all this duality all this stupidity and so he came and fell down at vashishta's feet please forgive me for what i have done as soon as his head touched the feet of the sage a spiritual current passed through him and spontaneously in his heart arose the brahma gayatri om bhur bhuvasva tat savitur varenyam bhargo devasya dhimahi dhiyo yona prachodayat spontaneously it is rising within him it inundated him and he merged into samadhi when he came out of that state he found vashishta blessing him and this gayatri emanating from within his heart continuously when he went back then vashishta told him now you have become a brahma rishi you have attained the knowledge of the supreme by overcoming all weaknesses at all levels and then when he returned back he gave this gayatri to everyone that is why he is the rishi who gave the world the gayatri so that this is this is a means you see what is the siddhi for the siddha becomes a means for those who are trying to become siddhas so the gayatri that is how it comes to us it is it encapsulates the essence of vedic wisdom because it is a prayer for dhi if you have understood the value of this higher level intelligence what is called the spiritual heart the awakening of this then you you get entitled to receive that knowledge if you don't understand its value the value of this level of spirituality how will the knowledge ever come to you so this is the gayatri mantra let's just discuss the meaning then we will repeat it om bhur bhuva swaha om is the symbol of brahman hmm? the sound symbol of brahman bhu bhuva swaha are the three planes of existence which bhu means actually this earth bhuva is the world of means pitralok jo kehte hain swa is swargalok the heavens hmm? now all these worlds there are slight different interpretations also which you will get of these three words bhu bhu bhuva swaha like for example bhu is considered the embodiment of vitality bhuva is the destroyer of suffering swa is the giver of happiness like the slightly different interpretations also you will find typically in our shastras bhu bhuva swa are these three worlds of this earth the world of means pitralok and uh, the world of the gods now all these three are illumined by what light tat savitur varenyam by the light of the sun who is varenyam who is the most uh, the best the choicest the most adorable one he is illumining all these three worlds bright the bright sun bhargo the destroyer of all sins devasya that divine one you see dev the dhatu for dev is div which is divinity shining the shining one dhimahi may he imbibe my intellect dhiyo this intellect which is ours yonaha prachodayat may he illumine that intellect and imbibe may my intellect become capable of imbibing this supreme knowledge in this way may he illumine my intellect hmm? so that i may get this brahma gyan brahma vidya so that i may experience the knowledge of the supreme reality may he so inspire my intellect the sun the most adorable one the divine being who illumines the three worlds may he so illumine my intellect that i will get the knowledge of the supreme this is the prayer of gayatri so let us repeat it ha huh? once repeat it after me om bhur bhuvasvah tat savitur varenyam bhargo devasya dhimahi dhiyo yona prachodayat so every syllable should be very clear confidently you must repeat it Hmm. See, I have put it here. Please see this. Every syllable should be very clear. When you repeat it, you can't mix up words and repeat it anyhow. It's a very powerful mantra. Om Bhur Bhuva Swaha. Once more, repeat it after me. Om Bhur Bhuva Swaha. Tat Savitur Varenyam. Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi. 
धियो यो न प्रचोदयात नाउ हाउ डू यू चैंट गायत्री यूजली इट इज प्रिस्क्राइब्ड दैट यू मस्ट चैंट इट इन द संध्या पीरियड विच मीन्स एट डॉन एंड एट डस्क these are very special times when nature is very quiet naturally the gayatri will fructify blossom within yourself if you practice it at that time dawn and dusk at least at these two periods and usually one not eight times repetition is recommended you can also do it 36 times at dawn 36 times in the noon and 36 times at dusk time and another thing you should remember is you can't do gayatri anywhere and anyhow you must do it in a clean place in a posture proper posture treat her respectfully i told you it is a po- very powerful mantra she is a devi how would you worship a devi hmm? so just repeating it anywhere repeating it half don't do that it it is something very sacred something very elevating so you must do it with full respect and then if you cannot do it one not eight times at least 12 times intensely with concentration you should do it with the meaning going on in your head hmm and then gayatri will yield its own fruit you know people do gayatri puraschcharan you might have heard of this in maharashtra thousands of people do it every year it is repeating 24 lakh gayatri in a specified period of time and they do it with such intensity after that period you should see their very face has changed it awakens your entire energy and lifts it to the level of realization it is actually divinizing you so that you may intuit the highest in you brahman in you hmm? so this is the power of gayatri only if you do it you will know it if you don't do it it will again remain like a theory to you you know madan mohan malviya who was the founder of bhu banaras hindu university he was a great advocate of gayatri puraschcharan he used to he did it many times in fact many people have done it and it is the best way to change your entire mechanism your very body will change i am telling you your genes will change your mind will change because it is awakening the faculty of dhi within you if it is done with concentration with with complete mind it will awaken what it is meant to awaken right within you and these five fold faculties of higher intelligence are required for success anywhere in your life please remember this i told you what are they dhi then medha pragna dhriti and smriti these are the five fold qualities of your intelligence dhi is your spiritual heart where you get this knowledge of brahman medha is your higher intelligence pragna is higher awareness dhriti is the higher will and smriti is memory complete memory so if you want all of these put together practice gayatri and see it was part and parcel of our life i received the gayatri when i was very young and uh, usually in india during upanayana ceremony they give it hmm so the the thing is this all these things have to be done to be known you have to do something about it it's not a theoretical concept i just told you you listen to it and it's done not like that Hmm. This is, you practice the chanting. You will see the change coming over you. Mind will just clear up. Intelligence will just awaken within you. You will understand all the dimensions of intelligence, not this stupid one unidirectional intelligence, which you don't know where it will take you, which is dependent on outer objects. Not that kind. A wholesome, holistic form of intelligence, which is all integrative, which sees the whole thing all together. this level of intelligence is required for higher you know understanding and medha actually helps you understand the scriptures mm, the subtleties a very refined intellect will be generated the subtleties of the scriptures become graspable 
So, all these blessings come with Gayatri. Practice it and see and you yourself will understand what it is about. That is why I gave you the whole story of Gayatri. So, that you remember the story and practice the chanting. Hmm? Today time is up, we will end here.